بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. We begin in the name of Allah and we ask Him to bless and protect His last and final Prophet, His family, His companions, and those who follow His way until the end of time. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be visiting you guys. It's my first time uh, to this community. I've been to Chicago a few times before, but this is my first time uh, to this area and to this masjid in specific. I've heard a lot about, for years, I've heard about a lot about you know this community and how long it's been around and the size of this community. Uh, but this is my first time, so alhamdulillah, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me. It's just amazing as I was driving in to see, um, you know, the different buildings that you have. I, I was asking Brother Ahmed Salam, I was like, what's that school? He's like, this is this school and that school and this is the mosque, mashallah. Uh, we're not that blessed in California in terms of the amount of land that you guys have. Right? So alhamdulillah, may Allah bless and protect and preserve this community and allow it uh, to continue to be a, a model community and a beacon and a source of goodness for, for other Muslims and other communities, insha'Allah. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to speak about, specifically uh, because we've you know, exited Ramadan and it's been a few weeks now, is different ways in which the heart becomes corrupt. You know, the Prophet said in a hadith that perhaps all of us have heard that, Ala inna wa fil jasadi mudra, that indeed in the heart, in the body, there is mudra, there is a piece of flesh. Then he said, صلحت صلحت That if this piece of flesh, if this is sound and upright, then the entire body will be sound and upright. And if this piece of flesh, it goes bad, then the entire body will also follow and go bad. And then he said, It is the heart. But the heart the Prophet was talking about over here was not the physical heart. But rather it is the heart, the spiritual heart. The heart that contains our faith. We see on a daily basis people walking, people talking, people engaging in life, people driving, people going to school, people at work. But many of the people that we see around us, they're dead. They're physically alive, their heart is beating, it's pumping blood. But spiritually it's completely dead. It's void of life. It's as if they are dead. One of the scholars, when talking about the heart, he said very beautifully, he said that Al-Qalbu Malikul A'ba, that the heart is the king of all of the organs, all of the limbs, all of the body. The king, the heart is at the center. And then he said, Wa baqiyatul a'ba, everything else, your fingers, your hands, your arms, your legs, your mouth, your tongue, your head, everything. All of that is junuduhu. It's like the forces and the soldiers of that heart. Then he went on to explain, he said that if the king is a good king, he's upright, he's just, he's sound, he's righteous, then the body parts will follow. But if the king is corrupt, then everyone under the king, whether it's your eyes, your ears, your tongue, right, your hands, your feet, everything else will follow the king. And I specifically wanted to talk about just a few ways in which the heart becomes corrupt. But before, I wanted to talk about, because there's, we find when, when we talk about, when we look into Tazkiyatul Nafs, purification of the soul, we find that scholars, they talked about many different ways in which the heart has, can become corrupt, right? So I want to focus on five or six, right? But before I get to those five or six, I want to mention maybe five ways or six ways that primary ways that the heart becomes corrupt. For example, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions, he says, that he says the greatest corruptors of the heart are the following. He says, kathratul mukhalafa. He says, an abundance of mixing with people. Or what we would call excessive socializing. Nothing wrong with socializing. We as humans, we have a need to socialize, to be around other people. I travel, you know, every weekend, every other weekend. One of the most difficult parts about traveling is the loneliness. Like you're at the airport alone, you're at the hotel room alone. It's just excessive loneliness. We as humans, we have a need to be around others. We want to be around others. I mean, can you imagine going to a very scenic place, right? I'm going to describe California, my apologies right now. 
right? Beaches, mountains, beautiful weather. Right? Now, you could look at it, but if you're by yourself, you're just kind of staring. But if you're with someone else, immediately you tell them, you look at them, you say, isn't that so beautiful? Right? Because once again, we as humans, we have that need to socialize, to interact with others. Whether they be spouses, whether they be friends, classmates, colleagues, co-workers, we have that need. But what the scholars, they say, is one of the biggest corruptors of the heart is kathratul mukhalifa, excessive socialization. Why excessive socialization? Because when we're excessively socializing, a number of things happens. One, we don't have enough time for our personal relationship with Allah. This idea of just being in khalwa, in privacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're always around people. So when you're alone, you don't even know how to act. You don't know what to do. You just begin wasting time. Because it's such a strange concept to be by yourself. Right? And now part of that excessive socialization is you know, all of social media. Nothing against social media, but the excessive nature of it. And then also, right, when you're excessively socializing with others, right? Naturally, if you keep talking, you keep talking, eventually someone in your friend circle is gonna backbite. Eventually someone is gonna cuss. Eventually someone, go someone is going to engage in something in terms of speaking about something that they shouldn't. Right? The benefits of socializing with others are many, but the harms of excessive socializing are also many. So Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, one of the primary ways in which the heart becomes corrupt is excessive socialization. Then he also says, tamanni. And what he means by tamanni is excessive hope. Just keep, we're hoping and hoping for things from this world. You know, one of the scholars, he said, he said, this dunya, or he said tamanni, hoping for things from this world, is like a bahrun, is like an ocean. La sahila lahu. It has no shore. And each hope is like a wave. And once you get into the ocean, you're hit with wave left and right. You see something advertised and they sell it to you, you need it. And if you get it, then you see the next thing. And then you see the next thing. Or you see people with other things. And you just continuously want it. You know, I'm from California, born and raised in California. I can't speak about the culture of Chicago. But California is a lot of dunya. It's a lot of dunya. And even if you're trying to be a practicing Muslim, it's like the dunya is hitting you in the face. You're watching or seeing what people drive, what people wear, where people live, how people live. Right? And then on top of that, the society that we live in, right? It's a consumer society. Everything is being sold to us. Finally get the phone, you're so happy. And then by the time the next Eid comes, the next phone is out. Right? Or the next new thing is out. Or, you know, people have this obsession with clothes. Right? Perhaps we've done this before. Right? All of us may be guilty to some level. You have to go to a wedding, you have to go to some event, you have to go to a graduation, you have to go to something. You open the closet, the closet's full of clothes. And you look through and you're like, I have nothing to wear today. Yeah, right? <laughs> I got nothing to wear. It's a strange concept, right? You go to the kitchen, you open the fridge, you look at the shelves, nothing to eat. But there's an abundance of food. Why? Because you saw enough commercials, right? You heard about, you saw enough pictures and posts, right? You want something specific. And if that thing is not there, whether that piece of clothing or that piece of food, I have, I have nothing to wear today. This idea of, you know, when it comes to clothing, like, you know, let's say you have to, summer, the summer sometimes is wedding season in a lot of Muslim communities, right? So you got back weddings, or like one week into the next wedding, you have two different weddings, right? So you go to the first wedding, you wear an outfit, and then the second wedding comes along and you look through your closet and your eyes go upon that outfit that you wore last weekend. You're like, I can't wear that again. 
People saw me in that again already. This is a strange concept. I know it's become normal for a lot of us, but it is strange. Like this idea that, oh, people are going to see me in the same outfit twice. Like it's like our world is going to end all of a sudden. Like it, all of us to a certain extent, even myself, right? Like if I wear something the same one day and then have an event the next day, I'm like, okay, let me make sure I at least change the shirt. I can wear the same jeans, but people think I changed the outfit. Because we're just hoping. We have so many hopes. We're like, at least if I can't afford all of it, if I can't get all of it, I want to put on an image that I can so people can't see me in the same outfit twice. So he says, this excessive hope for things from this world. And he says, when a person falls in this, they're just going to drown because it is literally endless. You know, the idea right now that we're sitting in a room and the AC is on, hundreds of years ago, kings, kings could not have imagined this. Like we're living in greater luxury than, than some of the greatest or some of the richest people that walked on the face of the earth hundreds of years ago. They had people serving them, but they couldn't have people blow, blow them cold air. And we just sit in a room and it's just like blowing, right? Alhamdulillah, right? Alhamdulillah, right? I was in the plane today. I was flying from, from L.A. to Chicago. And at one point, for whatever reason, right, it got a little hot in the plane. It got a little hot in the plane. It did, right? And I had a sweater on. I, it wasn't bothering me. I was knocked out. But I, I felt it. It got a little hot in the plane, right? And I heard the people around me start complaining. Naturally, right? Did you guys turn the heater on in this day? Why is it so cold? And once again, I felt the heat too. I'm human, right? But I was like, subhanAllah, that's so crazy. Like, we're flying in the air right now. We're flying in the air. It was like, hey, could you change, it, change the temperature? I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty insane. Like, what's going on here? Right? Because we've gotten to, used to so much luxury and so much comfort right, in our lives that... We think we, we deserve everything that we see, or we need everything. The third thing, he says, Another way in which the heart becomes corrupt is becoming attached to other than Allah. Becoming attached to other than Allah. Now, when, it talks, when we talk about becoming attached to other than Allah, look, all of us here, we believe in Allah. But sometimes, sometimes our heart gets attached to something. And we don't say that thing is our God. We don't treat that thing as our God. We don't bow to that thing. But if you're in prayer, if you're in Maghrib prayer, and if you're wondering if the bulls or the bears are losing or winning, first of all, most likely they're losing. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from LA, gonna have to throw in a few shots. You know it. <laughs> um, I, have, I have some really good friends, I have some really, really good friends from Chicago. Sheikh Omar Hidruj, uh, Sheikh Hassan Natur, Sheikh Tariq Muslih, and others that were involved in different communities. And some of them are really, at, the, the, you know, they have that pride, just like I have LA pride, they have Chicago pride. And, Every year before football season starts and every year before basketball season starts, they tell me, the Bears are going to win the Super Bowl this year. The Bulls are going to win the championship this year. And it's been like 10 years at this point. <laughs> and I'm like, can you just stop at this point? It's embarrassing. But going back, right? If you're praying and you're thinking about something like that, you know, you've, you've, seen, you've seen the videos before. Let's just use sports as an example. Right? Someone's favorite sports team lo loses, and they're just like drowning in tears. It's like as if their life has ended. Their world has come crushing down. Their favorite soccer team lost. Right? Like I I've heard f stories from kids like they're a huge fan of a particular team, and everyone in their class knows it. And then you know it's like the championship or whatever, and their team loses. The next day, they're so overcome with grief, they, don't they can't go to school. I've, I've seen kids like this, 
right? It's just like they're so attached to it. Realize that the way Allah created our spiritual heart, it cannot be attached to Allah and something else in a complete sense at the same time. You cannot be, let me just, you cannot be. I know that, like, you know, you, you hear the, the term sometimes when it comes to sports, you hear the word, I'm a diehard, right? I'm a diehard. You can't be, you can't be attached to Allah and a diehard fan of something else. Whether it be a diehard fan of music or a diehard fan of this or that, right? This idea of our spiritual hearts, yes, we can like other things, have inclinations, watch sports, watch this, watch that, as long as it's permissible, right? And like these things and enjoy these things and be affiliated with them. Nothing wrong with that. But the attachment in the spiritual heart should be to Allah. And then they also mention, and I kind of referenced this already, but kathratu ta'am, eating excessively, right? And a lot of times people think when we talk about eating excessively, it's like it's restricted to anyone that's struggling with their weight or someone that's overweight. No, eating excessively applies across the board. Sometimes our bodies may not show it. But this idea of, you know, I still can't do it. And I'm not trying to hate on anyone that does it. But you know sometimes when like a new restaurant opens up, right, mashallah, you guys have a lot of halal foods. So I don't know if it's the same hype, right? But sometimes like in California and other places, a new halal place opens up and it has a lot of hype, right? People will stand like three hours in line, two hours in line, right? To, to eat at that restaurant. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Just for me, it's a strange concept. I was in Austin a few months ago, and everyone told me, there's this brisket place, like you have to go to. It's like the best halal brisket in North America, right? But they're like, there's a three-hour wait. I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to find the local Muslim place, right? Wait two, three minutes for them to make me food, and... Save my time. I don't care how good the food is. Three hours, I'm going to stand in line? Like, absolutely not. It's insane. Right? But this idea of, you know, we just came out of the month of Ramadan. Right? People are so, like, so engrossed in, like, what is going to be my, for my iftar? Right? So much so that people, like, you know, you're like 15, 20 minutes from the masjid, and I hear this complaint every year. They're like, man, there's not enough time between iftar and, and isha time in Ramadan. Same amount of time throughout the year. How long does it take you to eat? Right? Like, I mean, you fasted for like 12 hours, 13 hours. You don't have to eat for the same amount of time. Right? But, <laughs> I'm, you know, ask, ask imams or ask young people who from a young age have, ha have had to lead taraweeh. Right? They'll tell you that like as soon as Maghrib time comes in, like there's a mental clock. It starts clicking. You're like a few dates, water, chicken and rice, whatever it is, let's go. Maghrib, I'm ready to go. And you're like, sometimes you'll find out like there's an abundance of time. But it's like we're just looking at the food, right? Wow. It's, you know, we could break our fast on, on dates and water. And if we walked away, we'd realize that actually, hey, like, I'm pretty satiated. Like, yes, I'm, I'm still hungry, but I'm still pretty satiated. Now, what happens, and many scholars talk about this, when you, when you eat excessively, what happens as, as, as a result of that? How do you feel? Huh? Sluggish, lazy, sleepy. And then you're like, man, why is Taraweeh so hard? Right? And the next one, Naturally, the scholars mention is kathratun nawm, sleeping excessively. It's strange that we could sleep in on a Saturday, we could sleep in on a Sunday, right? You go to sleep, you wake up, you pray fajr, you go back to sleep, you wake up, you like sleep, sleep in. I have young kids, I don't get to sleep in anymore. Like anytime I'm home, like khalas, like it's like, if I go to sleep after fajr, it's like 7.30, one of the kids. Mama, right? I'm like, dude. Like, please, 15 more minutes, 30 more minutes, right? You don't get to sleep in anymore. But I remember being young. You could sleep, you could sleep in after Fajr, like 11 a.m., even make it to Dhuhr, right? And you wake up, and you know what? You're tired. You're like, can I go back to sleep? Right? 
But on the days that you have a final, on the days that you have a huge exam where you have to get to work early in the morning, you go to sleep, you sleep five, six hours, you wake up, and you, you're tired, you're tired. But you go from morning to nighttime, and you have a really productive day. You go to work, you go to school, you take care of your own responsibilities, you show up to the masjid perhaps, and you had a really productive day and you only slept four or five hours. Once you sleep excessively, right, you wake up and you feel even more lazy. So these are some of the primary ways in which the heart becomes corrupt, right? Now, I want to focus on a few other ones that are perhaps things that don't necessarily come to your mind right away. Imam Hassan al-Basri, who was from the Tabi'in, the generation that came after the companions, he said, the heart becomes corrupt in six primary ways. And you'll see some overlap in between what I'm about to mention and what I mentioned. Right? But he said the heart becomes corrupt in primarily six ways. He said, number one, committing sins in hope of repenting. Committing sins in hope of repenting. You know, when you read the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, who wanted to harm Yusuf alayhi salam? His brothers, right? What do they say? They say that let's kill him or let's get rid of him. And we will be, after we do this act, after this, we'll be righteous. Like they planned the sin and they planned the righteousness after the sin. It's like, hey, this is okay, but we're going to go to the masjid afterwards, so it's all good. Right? And Allah does say, in al hasanat yudhibna sayyi'at that indeed good deeds wipe away evil deeds. Right? I would meet people that were like, yeah, I want to go for hajj, right? but like, I want to get a little older, you know, I want to, because YOLO, you only live once. Right? Got to live, got to do everything I need to do or want to do, and then I'll go to hajj. I'll be like, you know, 50, 60, and then inshallah, وَتَكُونُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ We'll be righteous after that. <clears throat> Yesterday, a brother came up to me, I gave him, uh, khutbah in Southern California, and he came up to me and he said, that, look, I have, a sin. I have a friend that's struggling with a sin. So what's the sin? He said, he has, he, he's a good individual, he prays and everything, right? But he has a hard time lowering his gaze. He keeps, has a hard time all the time. And he was like, look, I know it's a sin. I was like, I was like you know what happened? I was like, you do that sin, whatever the sin is, because each sin, whatever it is, for each person, it can become an addiction. Whether it's backbiting people, whether it's not lowering your gaze, right? Whether it's lying, right? For each person, whatever our weakness is, right? And each one of us, we may have our own personal weaknesses, right? That sin can slowly become an addiction. So we become desensitized to how bad it is. We recognize that, yeah, it's haram, I shouldn't be doing it, but it's like, it's okay, like I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm showing up to the masjid on a Saturday night. But slowly by slowly, that sin becomes an addiction. It becomes part of who we are. It becomes part of our nature. And our hope is, yeah, like I know it's bad and one day I'll stop. People get stuck in this hope that I will stop, I will stop. But then slowly, slowly, gradually, gradually, it ruins a person's life. I've seen people in my life, may Allah protect all of us, that from an outsider's perspective, you know, they're a good Muslim. From an outsider's perspective. Right? And they're living their life, right? They have a sin or two that they're engaging in. It may not be even a major sin, just a small sin. They just keep doing it, but at the same time they're praying, they're fasting, they're doing everything, right? They're reading the Qur'an, but they're still continuing that sin, knowing it's bad. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right? They're off the rails, off the radar, off the map. You don't see them anymore. What happened? He's struggling with his faith. She's struggling with her faith. Really? Him? Her? How? They were always at the masjid. They were always praying. They were always part of the halaqa. What happened? What happened was exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. Right? When a person commits a sin, a stain is placed on their heart. 
Yes, he said that if they seek forgiveness, that stain is removed. But that seeking forgiveness has to be real forgiveness. If it's like, astaghfirullah, yeah, I got it, move on. It's not making a difference. You know, they say that the great scholar Imam Malik, when he met Imam al-Shafi'i, and he was amazed, he saw this young Imam al-Shafi'i who had this incredible memory. He said to Imam al-Shafi'i, he says, I see that Allah has placed the light of faith in your heart. That's a light that all of us have. The fact that we're at the masjid today, right now, the fact that you and I say that we believe in Allah means that every single one of us has some level of light. And no one's light is equal. Someone has an immense amount of light. Someone has very little light. But all of us have light. But then he told Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, فَلَا تُطْفِئْهُ بِظُلْمَةِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ Don't dare extinguish that light with the darkness of sins. Imagine, imagine that the faith that you and I, that we have in our heart, is like a light bulb, a brand new light bulb. You know, like, like that, that light that's, that's under the sisters right there? The amount of light that's giving, it's giving. Imagine that that is our faith, each one of us, that is our faith. One's looking at the light, it's just a light bulb, guys. It's just a light bulb, calm down. I know it's blessed because it's in the masjid, but it's still probably bought it from Home Depot, Lowe's, it's, you know, not even from Mecca or Medina, so it's just a light bulb. Um, but what happens, what happens over time to that light bulb? What happens? It degrades, right? The light gets less and less and less. And then one day, one day, you know, before they're about to start their program, they'll come in here, they'll turn on the switch, and they'll start flickering. They'll start flickering a little bit. Yes? Right? But then after the flickering, it'll, it'll just go back to that. It'll, it'll stay on. They'll say, okay, we got time. We got time. We got to change it. We got to change it. You know? Brother Ahmed Salam will be like, yeah. He'll make a note. We got to change that light bulb. Right? But then time will pass. He's like, I don't change light bulbs. I just set up the programs. Right? But time will pass, and everyone will forget that the light bulb was flickering. But then, a few months later, someone will come, and they'll turn on the switch, and what's going to happen? It's not going to turn on at all. Huh? Oh, I remember that light was flickering, and no one replaced it. That's our faith. That's our faith. Every time we pray, every time we do good, it's as if we're replacing it with a new light bulb or we're shining the light bulb. We're giving it more power, more energy. But every time we commit a sin, it's like we're putting some type of substance on that light bulb or inside that light bulb that's going to cause it to flicker. But as long as it turns on, we say, it's working. And for some people... One day, they'll wake up, and they've been committing a sin in hopes of repenting. They'll try to turn on that light bulb. Hey, Ramadan is starting. I need to fast. It's Fajr time. It's Isha time. I need to pray. They'll go to that switch within themselves, and there's nothing. It's black. It's darkness. That's why it corrupts the heart. That's why committing sins in hopes of repenting. Because it gives us this false perception that the light of faith will always be there and I can count on it. I don't have to work on it. That's the first. The second. He says, seeking knowledge and not applying it. We live in a time of information. We have more access to information, to Islamic information, and even information at large than scholars of the past. Like literally at our fingertips. Pick a subject, pick a topic, pick a class. You know, you hear about <clears throat> many institutions in Masajid, they advertise their class. Like, it can be in person, you can watch the live stream, right? It's like, what is it? It's in person, online, and on demand. So in person, like right now, right? Um, online, someone watching a stream, and then on demand, it's recorded, so you can come back and watch it. All types of access to information, right? I mean, just pick, right? You've got Islamic, you've got people, uh, people um, 
that, that are good people, right? Doing Islamic videos on, on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, good tweets on Twitter, right? Classes throughout the country, everything, right? Recitation of the Quran, pick your reciter, right? Even now, mashallah, um, Sheikh Maryam Amir, right? She created this WhatsApp, uh, sorry, not this, she created this app um, for sisters known, uh, named uh, Qari'a. Any of the sisters know about it? Yes? Some sisters know about it? Where you have like female reciters, right? So like encouraging, her idea was to encourage sisters to kind of learn Quran and look at these women that have memorized Quran and done it in the different recitations and have beautiful recitation as well, right? So much access to so much different stuff, right? But what's missing during our time is application. You know, there was an imam, I know, he told me, he said that he once invited a guest khatib to his masjid from out of town. And the khatib delivered a great khutbah. So a person from that community, he came to my friend who's the imam, and he said, man, that khatib, that, that khutbah was amazing. The imam asked him, what did you learn? What did you learn? What was your takeaway from the khutbah? Like imagine if you walked away, if you walked away today, and someone asked you, what did you learn? They're like, he's from California and he doesn't like the bulls and, and the bears. Right? You're like, okay, well, what did you learn? Right? So he asked him, what did you learn? And he's like, Ahmed, the guy just stood there. And he was like, well, you know, he's like, you know, it was a great performance. That's exactly what he said, right? Problem, right? Nowadays, when we go to lectures and, and gatherings, it's like, is he funny? Is he entertaining? Was he captivating? Imagine if someone got up here and they were just monotone. All of a sudden, we would just tune out. We're like, yeah, he's monotone. He doesn't know how to speak. Okay, yes, you know, the one delivering a sermon or a talk should, should be able to engage their crowd. At the same time, right, how much have you learned? What, what have you benefited? Like, what is your takeaway? You know, mashallah, it's nice to see some of the sisters. I'm not trying to understand it's a Saturday night. Everyone's trying to chill. So, like, if I showed up on a Saturday night, I would not show up with pen and paper, okay? Because, but mashallah, it's nice to see that some people show up. And I'm not trying to hate on anyone else, I promise, right? But it's nice to see that some people show up with, with a pen and paper, so like it's, it's guaranteed that even at, in, even at a time when you can write it down on your phone, right? Some people say still the best way to learn is to write it down because it will ensure that it stays ingrained within you. SubhanAllah, I remember like I know things that I've written down on my phone as notes when I've attended lectures in the past and things that I've physically written down. And literally the things that I've physically written down are the things that I still remember from my memory. The things that I took notes, I have to always go back to. The things I wrote down, subhanAllah, it's just something about the way we're, we're created is that I remember them. This idea of seeking knowledge and not applying it. You know, the scholars of hadith, we, we hear about, you know, the names, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Ahmed. One beautiful practice that many of the scholars of hadith they had was that anytime they wanted to record a hadith in their book, is that they would apply it first and then they would make it part of their book. I'll quickly share a beautiful incident. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, right? During his time, without getting into too much detail, there was a certain fitna, a certain trial and tribulation that was going on. And scholars were being pushed and forced to adopt certain opinions in regards to Islamic belief that were incorrect. Many scholars were forced and unwillingly they accepted. They didn't internally believe it, but to save their own lives, to save their families, they accepted. There were a few scholars that said, you know what? We realize that people will take our word seriously and we're not going to do it, even if it means we're tortured and, and so and so. So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, when this fitna began to spread and it was known that the ruling party or the ruling authority was searching for him, he went into hiding. And one of the places that he first went into hiding was into the houses of one of his friends. And no one knew he was there, he was safe. And he remained hiding there for a couple nights. And before the third night came, he told his friend whose house it was, he said to him, I want you to find me another place for me to hide. Find me another place that I can hide. 
So his friend was perplexed. You're safe here. No one knows you're here. Why would you want to hide in another place? So he says, find another safe place for me to hide. Once you do that, I'll tell you why. So the third night passed. His friend came to him. He came back home and he said, Imam Ahmed, I found a place for you to hide. You'll be safe there. But now explain to me why in your right mind, when they're searching for you, they want to capture you, they want to torture you, why do you want to find another place to hide? Imam Ahmed, he said, he said that I narrated, and Imam Ahmed's hadith book is called the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. He said, I narrated in my Musnad that during the hijrah, the migration of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina, that the Prophet ﷺ hid in the cave for three nights. The Prophet ﷺ hid in the cave for three nights. Now there are certain narrations that reach us that are literally just reporting what happened in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They're not meant to be applied. There are other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ told us, do this, pray this many sunan, say this when you leave the house. Those are meant to be applied. The Prophet ﷺ hiding in the cave is not something that's supposed to be implemented or followed. It's not like all of us are supposed to go hiding for three days and be like, Mama, Baba, I'm back. I was just, you know. It's not, it's not supposed to be, do, we're not supposed to do that. But Imam Ahmed was in a situation where he was forced to hide. So he was like, let me, fo- let me see, let me see if there's something the Prophet ﷺ did that I can follow. We would call that, in our time, we would call that extreme. But in that time, it meant loving Allah and His Messenger. This is what it means to seek knowledge and apply it. Not just go to a lecture, go to a khutbah and seek to be entertained and be like, oh, this is a great performance. What was your takeaway from it? There are many people that could have attended tonight, but for one reason or another, they didn't make it. But because you and I are here, it doesn't make us better than them. Perhaps they learned something five years ago, three years ago, and every single day they're applying it in their life. You know, sometimes I go to communities where I've given khutbah and then I go back and I've given khutbah. And subhanAllah, once in a while I'll meet people and they'll say, Shaykh, you gave a khutbah over here three years ago and it changed my life. And I'll be like, well, what was the topic? And I'll be like, they'll tell me the topic. They'll, they'll like summarize the khutbah for me. And I'll like think, oh, I think I remember that khutbah. But it's like, for me, it's a reminder. I'm like, subhanAllah, I, I'm the one that said the khutbah. And you've been applying it for years. And I can barely even remember giving the khutbah. Much less, or applying it. The idea is whatever information that Allah blesses you with, try to implement it. That idea of, when the Prophet he would say, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'a. Oh Allah, I ask you for knowledge that is beneficial. Meaning knowledge that I'm able to apply. One of the scholars, he said, just like wealth has zakah that is due upon it on a yearly basis, knowledge has zakah that is due upon it. But the zakah of knowledge is that we act upon it. Think about the things, right? I just want to, anyone in there, I don't want to age myself. Who's, who's under 20? Raise your hand. Who's under 20? Under 20, raise your hand, mashallah. Okay. Who's like, uh, okay, you can put your hands down. Who's like 30 and under? So, sorry, between 20 and 30, that's confusing. Between 20 and 30, okay? Okay. How many things, how many things were we taught as children? How many things that w- were we taught just a few years ago, right? We were all taught as kids, when you enter the masjid, you should enter with your right foot and say, louder, louder. Allahumma iftahli abwaba rahmati. And when you exit the masjid, you should exit with your left foot and you should say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Okay? And when you leave your house in the morning, you should say, Ah, someone said it, huh? Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah. Yes? Right? There are so many things that we were taught. I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty, myself included. I'm, I'm guilty of not applying as much as I should. But don't raise your hand. But if we were to raise our hands right now and just ask, Today when you enter the masjid, who said Allahumma iftahli abwa wa We know for a fact that perhaps less than five people in this room would raise their hand. Not because we're bad people. Not because we're like we're intentionally forgetting. 
Because we're sometimes like, you know, subhanAllah, think about this, right? MashaAllah, this is an amazing program. But we came here to seek knowledge, to gain more knowledge. But there are simple little things that we could do that are so powerful. Each one of us, the hope is that we try to pray our five prayers and do what Allah has obligated upon us. But you know what is going to distinguish one person from another? Is those small little things that we were taught or that we heard. One person won't ever apply them and one person will apply them. That is the idea of being a sabiqoon a sabiqoon. That is the idea of being those that are muqarrabun, those that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, and I have a few more, I'll quickly go through them. So if there's any so we can leave a few minutes for questions and answers. <clears throat> Number three, practicing or doing good actions without ikhlas. You know. When I was young, when I was in high school, when I was in college, I remember in college specifically, every gathering that I would go to, every MSA, every conference, it would start with, let's renew our intention. And I remember I would, again and again, I'm like, do you not have anything else to say? Like day and night is like renew our intention. I was like, why do you think I'm here? You know? But as you get older, as you get older, you realize like how much more importance, how much more important ikhlas is. You know the beauty of ikhlas? Like when a person is truly sincere, the smallest righteous action, the smallest, smallest deed with an immense amount of ikhlas, sincerity, can make that action grand. And the greatest action with no ikhlas at all can make that grand action worthless. That's the power of ikhlas at the end of the day. Someone walks in the parking lot of the masjid, they see a piece of trash, they pick it up, and they put it in the trash can. With the simple thought that this is the house of Allah, I need to respect and revere and honor the house of Allah. Simple. Someone else goes to hajj, come back, and they haven't earned one single good deed. Difference. Us. That is literally its power. You know, we live in a time where every good deed you do, you got to post it on social media. Right? Now, I'm not saying if you go to Mecca, Medina, if you, you know, you're at the masjid, you can't post about it. But you don't have to post about it every single time. Every single time you did a good deed, every time you were involved in a good act. Right? So I'm not, once again, please, please don't look down on other people. But it is always slightly funny, slightly funny, right? When, you know, you see people, or sometimes maybe we've been guilty of this before, like you go to Mecca and Medina, and you tell your friend, you're like, hey, can you take a picture of me? So you stand next to the Kaaba, you stand next to the Masjid, and you just raise your hands. You've all seen the pictures, right? You just raise your hands, and you're like, hey, take a picture. Like, do you know how absurd that is? Like, first of all, we all know that person in that picture, they weren't making dua. It was for the picture. But it's like, this is such a powerful act. And you ruined it for a selfie? I was sitting on the plane, and there was a woman sitting next to me. Okay? Before I fell asleep, before I fell asleep, she was, she was taking a selfie of herself. Right? And she had like a coffee or something. Right? And like... I was trying to find the right position so I could tell, right? Like she kept fixing her hair. She took a few shots, right? I'm like, okay, whatever, like, right? I woke up an hour later and she was doing the same thing. I was like, wow, like, it's taking you this long? I was like, wow. Like, but it's like, you know, like this idea of Also, my voice, it's, it's running. I, it's, I've had this cough. I'm not sick. I just, I just cough. Okay, can you guys hear me? This? It's on. It's off. Oh, it's been off? The light is on. See, it's, like, it's, that, it's like that light bulb, you know? Light <laughs> is perfect. I'm just joking. Um, okay, so let's try this without a mic. So. But, like... Concept, right? We've become so obsessed with 
like our image and the way people see us. Sometimes when we go to the masjid, it's like, hey, I gotta dress my best. I gotta dress my best. You wanna really test your sincerity? Pray at home in your room and there's no one around. Is the khushu is the Fatiha read at the same speed or read faster, read slower? Praying in the sense the true servitude of the As a person has ikhlas or not. Are they only doing the action? Others are doing the action. Look, all of us it gets easier to do a good action. Nothing wrong with that. Something that we do by ourselves that no one knows about. If you're young, is there a good deed that you do that not even your parents know about? Those actions that no one knows about besides Allah, those will be Now, ikhlas is one of the most important Forget why you're doing the action. Just forget who you're doing it for. Forget who you're doing it for. Sustenance of Allah without appreciating Him. We talked about food earlier. We're about eating the sustenance of Allah primarily, we're talking about eating food. About all the other ways that we consume the sustenance of Allah. Where we live, right? What we buy. All of these things. Only a few of my servants know about this. One of our most basic necessities is 